Among historic acts and political deliverances, there is none more weighty in significance and results, none more famous in the annals of the world than the American Declaration of Independence. The document which preserves it to all ages is a witness to the world that freedom resting not on institutions but on the necessities of human nature is no mere abstract idea but a vital principle of national life. At the beginning of 1776, the tide of public opinion in the colonies was setting strongly toward national independence. Lexington and Bunker Hill had spoken their message to America and to the British government. All the other colonies had come into line with New England. The Second Continental Congress was at work with growing legislative powers. The New England forces had been adopted as the Continental Army with Washington as Commander-in-Chief. Meanwhile, King George III and his minister, Lord North, had continued their coercive policy and strengthened their war measures. Before this, it had become evident that to defer any longer, the formation of an independent government was to keep up an unnecessary source of weakness. Already the voice of the nation had protested unmistakably against the longer continuance of anarchy. The first definite step toward such a change had been taken in 1775 by New Hampshire. On October 11th, their delegates had petitioned Congress to allow them to establish a government, but Congress, having still hopes of the success of the petition, had deferred answering their appeal. The majority of Congress saw at last that independence was only a question of time. An answer was sent to the Convention of New Hampshire, recommending it to form a government. Similar advice was sent the next day to South Carolina and a little later to Virginia. Yet New Hampshire shrank from so decisive a step and coupled the formation of their new government with a studious expression of their allegiance. Virginia showed a nobler spirit. In January, the convention passed a motion instructing their delegates to recommend Congress to throw their ports open to all nations and thus to cast off the commercial supremacy of England. But the mere establishment of independent state governments was not enough. An imperial government also independent of England was essential to establish independence without confederation would be only doing half the work. In the words of Franklin, we must all hang together unless we would all hang separately. About this time, Franklin's scheme for a confederation was laid before Congress. The scheme did not include, but it evidently implied, independence. Franklin had been throughout a strenuous advocate of reconciliation, as long as reconciliation was possible and his opinion ought to have convinced all that the time for separation had come. But the timid counsels of his colleague Dickinson overruled the motion, and the scheme of a confederation was not even formally considered. On February 16th, the question of opening the ports was formally laid before Congress. In the next month, measures were taken which clearly showed that independence was at hand. A private agent was sent to France by the authority of the Committee of Secret Correspondence, and the instructions of the commissioners sent to Canada contained a clause inviting the people of Canada to set up such a form of government as will be most likely in their judgment to produce their happiness. The clause was objected to as implying independence and gave rise to a debate, but was ultimately carried. At last, after seven weeks' deliberation, the Congress resolved to emancipate the colonies from all commercial restrictions, and on April 6th, the ports of America were thrown open to the world. On March 27th, South Carolina proceeded to construct a government. They asserted as their principle of action that the good of the people is the origin and end of all government, and they set forth the misconduct of the king, the parliament, and the officers of the English government. At the same time, they introduced no change into the system of representation or the qualification of voters. On May 4th, the Assembly of Rhode Island passed an act discharging the inhabitants of the colony from allegiance to the king and at the same time authorized its delegates in Congress to conclude a treaty with any independent power for the security of the colonies. On May 6th, the Assembly of Virginia met at Williamsburg. After a declaration that all Pacific measures were useless and that they had no alternative left but an abject submission to the will of those overbearing tyrants or a total separation from the Crown and Government of Great Britain, they passed two resolutions, the first empowering their delegates at the Convention to propose a declaration of independence and a confederation of the colonies. 
II appointing a committee to draw up a declaration of rights and a scheme of government for the colony. On June 12th, the Declaration of Rights was laid before the Assembly, and on the 29th, a constitution was produced. The Assembly then proceeded to elect a governor. The choice fell on Patrick Henry. Rightly was he who had first foreseen independence and bidden his countrymen look the danger of it in the face, deemed worthy to be the first to govern the state which he had called into being. All the colonies except Pennsylvania and Maryland followed the example of Virginia, and when, on July the 1st, the motion for independence was laid before the Congress, the delegates of nine colonies were pledged to vote in its favor. The delegates of Pennsylvania and Maryland were divided. Those of South Carolina unanimously opposed independence. The New York delegates were all in favor of independence and represented the opinion of the colony, but could not vote as their convention had not yet been duly elected. When the question came forward for decision next day, Dickinson, who had opposed it on the first day with great earnestness, stayed away as did one of his colleagues, and the vote of Pennsylvania was altered. Another delegate arrived from Delaware, whose vote turned the scale, and South Carolina, rather than stand alone, withdrew its opposition. New York alone was unable to vote, and on July 2nd, by the decision of 12 colonies, without one adverse vote, it was resolved that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is, and ought to be, totally dissolved. Seldom was the irony of history more strikingly illustrated than when Hancock, a rebel specially selected for proscription by the English government, put the question to the vote and declared the American colonies forever independent. Thomas Jefferson of Virginia was selected to draw up the declaration which had been resolved upon. His pen had already served his country. In 1774, he had published a summary view of the rights of British America, setting forth the dangers which menaced the country and encouraging the people in defense of their liberties. He had signalized himself in his own colony by his opposition to slavery. Wherever he was, there was found a soul devoted to the cause of liberty, power to defend and maintain it, and willingness to incur all its hazards. On July 4th, the Declaration was produced. It declared the abstract principles on which their secession was justified. It then drew up an indictment against the King in 18 heads, setting forth the various ways in which he had proved himself a tyrant unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Finally, it declared that the United Colonies were free and independent states, that the connection with Great Britain was and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they had full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. Seldom in human events do the facts of history carry their own explanation so clearly with them. A people who had grown up gradually, almost unconsciously, under democratic institutions, at last saw those institutions subverted. To preserve the spirit of them, they changed their form. We must not be misled into the error of underrating the importance of the American struggle by any idea of the insignificance of the issue at stake. We must not suppose that it was, as an earnest and eloquent writer has called it, a war for the vindication of the principle of representative taxation. Its immediate origin, it is true, involved no vital interest, such as often has been at stake when nations have risen against their rulers. But rebellions may fall out on small occasions. They do not spring from small causes, was said by the first and wisest of political philosophers. Taxation was, as Burke says, that by which the colonists felt the pulse of liberty, and as they found that beat, they thought themselves sick or sound. The whole key to the American Revolution lies in two facts. It was a democratic and a conservative revolution. It was the work of the people, and its end was to preserve, not to destroy, or to construct afresh. The policy of an early father of New England, in a revolution burn all and build afresh, it was far from being that of his descendants. Throughout the whole war of independence, the colonists had a fixed known end in view. More than that, they had already within themselves the means for effecting that end and making it enduring as far as what is human. 
can endure, for the future that they proposed to themselves was not independent of their past. It was a fuller development of it. There was no need for beginning with the year one or for throwing aside as worn out anything that their ancestors had left them, and it was essentially a democratic revolution. Throughout the movement came from the people. The very blunders made by the hesitation and timidity of Congress were the mistakes of an assembly of delegates, not of representative statesmen. When the final step was taken, the Congress was not the originator of it, but was little more than a mouthpiece giving expression to the declared wishes of the nation.